In the following seminar, Ms. Pooja Shukla, Senior Lecturer in the Li Shao Ki School of Business and Administration at the Open University of Hong Kong, speaks on the topic of ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, which are the three non-financial criteria for assessing corporate sustainability. Ms. Shukla explains how ESG has become a crucial factor for making investment decisions. She points out that ESG is not just an agenda to be discussed in the boardroom, but also something that needs to be genuinely reflected in the company's culture. Today, in this seminar, we are going to talk about ESG. Before I begin, I want to congratulate you on your decision to attend this seminar. Because no matter which kind of field you are in, whether you are in business, administration, law, finance, accounting, ESG is going to touch your life this way, that way, directly, indirectly. There is no way you can avoid ESG. In this seminar, we are going to discuss if ESG is just another boardroom matter, if ESG is just an another agenda item on the board's table, or if the whole company needs to embrace this culture. I'm sure all of you know about this case, Samsung. Some of you probably are the users. Some of you are the biggest fans. Some of you already know that this is the best brand. How many of you remember Galaxy Note 7 case, when if you were charging the battery, there was a high probability of an explosion because of overheating. If you read the news, you would know how much criticism this product received, how much of legal battle Samsung had to fight for proving and proving again that it was an honest mistake and there was no way that they could have avoided this. Now, step back and think of yourself as Samsung. You are a big brand, multi-million dollar company. You have built this brand more than 30 years. You made multiple hundreds and thousands of products. Everyone liked your products. They may have talked about it, they may not have talked about it. You made one mistake, everyone wants to talk about it. It's in the media, everyone wants to talk about it, even in their homes. Whether it was Hong Kong or Korea or US, there were a lot of cases of explosions. To the extent that you could not even take a flight with Samsung Galaxy Note in your pocket. Imagine that kind of brand and this kind of criticism. How much Samsung would have taken care to produce and check and recheck their product security, safety, and still this lapse. Now, as a company, you face legal threats, you face financial situations, your reputation is at stake. So, ESG, is important. Now, when you have understood how much of one mistake can cost a company, now I will tell you what ESG is about. First of all, very basic question, what is ESG? E stands for environmental, S stands for social, and G for governance. When you say environmental, you say climate change, how much of pollution you are creating, how much, how well you are taking care of your natural resources like water, air, pollution, how you are exploiting the natural resources. When you say social, it means the society at large. What kind of health and safety issues you have for your labor? Uh, do you have any kind of discriminatory policies? Do you have gender discrimination? Are you empowering enough women in your office or your factories? Governance, in simple terms, is corporate governance, which means how well is your board diversity? Are you taking uh, enough policies for anti-corruption? Do you have enough 
anti-money laundering policies? Do you have internal controls? Are you aware of the risks that you are exposed to? And how much of uh, value your business has in terms of business ethics? Or you just value profitability at all costs? Very, very briefly, the story of ESG. Uh, to begin with, ESG has existed in one form or the other. But formally, the story of ESG started not very long ago, in 2004. It has not even been 20 years since. So UN Secretary General Kofi Annan invited 50 CEOs of major financial institutions. He wrote letters to them asking for their suggestions as to how we can integrate the components of ESG in the business so that the businessmen do not keep concentrating on profitability only and we kind of get rid of all the natural resources that we have and the businesses become a burden. He started with this vision of integrating these aspects in the business so that businesses are responsible, they are answerable and accountable to you as a customer to you as someone who is working for them. After he wrote the letters, he received an overwhelming support from the investors base holding $6 trillion in 2004. Today, this number is over 90 trillion US dollars, which at a glance tells you how important ESG has become in just last 16 years. This has grown from 6 trillion to more than 90 trillion. This is a quantifiable amount, so it is easy to talk. The impact of this was that the UN principles of responsible investment, which generally people talk about as PRI, in New York Stock Exchange was, were launched, after which Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative was also launched. If you are a student, I highly recommend you to go to the website of SSEI and read about it. What kind of guidelines they have given, what kind of assistance they are providing you as a company, as a customer also. Very interesting website. Now, in the rest of my seminar, I'm going to use these terms a lot. So I wanted to build a basic framework so that you know what I'm going to talk about. The first concept is CSR, which is Corporate Social Responsibility, which means how responsible you are. So you basically take the ownership of your actions. Whatever behavior that you are adopting, you take responsibility of that. If I'm doing this, I take the responsibility. It's not that I'm going to shake off my responsibility saying, oh, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. The next concept is ESG which is actually a criteria for disclosure. So when I say disclosure, it means reporting. You report what you have done in ESG, what has been your trajectory, that in 2018, I was here, in 2019, I'm here, in 2020, I, I want to be here, and the years to come. So this is a kind of goal or a fact sheet. Next concept is SRI socially responsible investment, which means the criteria that investors use to select which kind of companies they should be investing in. So imagine if you are an, an investor, what is your primary target? Profitability, low risk, more profitability, lower risk. So you want to make sure that the companies where you are investing in are going to give you better profitability and the risks in terms of components of E, S, and G are lower. If you are an investor, let's say you have $1 trillion and you see a company which is perfectly uh, profitable, it is giving you, let's say, 15% of return. Awesome, I want to give you my money. But what about the hidden aspects? What about this company? does not have even one board member who is a woman. What about this company polluting water? 
What about this company employing labor and not following human rights? Do you still want to invest in that company? I guess not. There are so many cases where you can see that companies had been so profitable, but they had to retract because they fell into the trap of ESG. When the case of Samsung Galaxy Note 7 happened, do you know what happened? The stock price fell by more than 8% in just one day. Can you imagine the impact, the financial impact, the reputational impact that it had? If you are a brand, there is no way you want to lose your face. You have to admit that, OK, I did this mistake. And this, uh, these, this is the list of steps that I'm planning to take or I have already taken to, to make good of the mistakes that I have done. Samsung reported more than 35 cases of explosion. Imagine the cost of life. Imagine the risk of life that it caused. The, the kind of mistrust it gave to its customers. Imagine if you have a grandmother who is using Galaxy Note 7. Would you trust? No. You want, to, you want best for your family. And especially in these kind of scenarios, you want to make sure that everything is perfect. Recently, we had this case of explosion in Beirut. I'm sure all of you are aware. Today, I read the news that the, uh, the government officials have resigned. Imagine these kind of issues are causing the governments to change. And I want you to imagine that pressure for a company C-suite empl employees. If you are a director, if you are a CEO, if you are a CFO, can you imagine what kind of risks you are facing? You can get arrested. You have so many charges on you. Now, I have prepared this very brief matrix to show you how the concept of profitability is changing. Again, very, very basic. What is the definition of business? I'm sure all of you know. The basic criteria of business is you are providing a commercial uh, transaction or services for profit. This is the definition of business. But what if I tell you that this definition not correct? You have to believe me, and I will prove you why. If you talked to me that, oh, I have this, my grandfather had this business 50 years ago, and his sole motive was profitability, I would trust you. But if you tell me that right now I have a listed company, and my sole motive is profitability, I don't trust you. I don't trust you, you are lying. Because right now, the shift has changed from profitability to sustainability. Everyone wants to know if your business is not just profitable, but sustainable also. If you have human rights issue, no matter how profitable you are, you're not sustainable. If people are suffering because of usage of your products, your business is not sustainable. So in this matrix, as you can see that we have profitability as the first criteria, which is the first priority of a traditional investor. The second group of investors that we have is ethical investor. So let's say you have a personal belief that you do not want to invest in a company which produces weapons, which is into mis missiles, you are against war, you are a peace-loving person. So you would not invest in a company which is producing bombs, atom bombs. If you are a person of a religious belief, or you think that any company which produces tobacco or alcohol, I don't want to invest in that company. You know, a few religions prohibit the usage of alcohol. So if you are a very religious person, you would be covered under a, the definition of ethical investor. So you would not give your money to the companies who invest in tobacco, alcohol, uh, weapons. So to these kind of ethical investors, ethical investing is their first priority. The third category is socially responsible investor whose first priority is impact 
investing, which means an investment which is going to give impact, which is going to bring some change in the society. And when I say society, I mean E, S, and G. So the different priorities are listed in this matrix showing the shift from traditional to socially responsible investor. Now let us see about how the journey of ESG has been in Hong Kong. I would say Hong Kong has been rather slow in embracing ESG. When ESG started with Kofi Annan in 2006, a lot of different kind of exchanges took the initiative and they said that we are going to go ahead and embrace this. We are going to make this applicable. In initially, they started off being companies, offering companies to uh, disclose ESG on voluntary basis and gradually they moved to mandatory requirements. Hong Kong, however, has made ESG mandatory only in 2020. Better late than never. So as of now, all the listed companies in Hong Kong are responsible to disclose ESG in their annual reports. Now, as they say, data is the new oil. I'm sure you would all agree. So you have data. Data is vital. Data is the key. If you do not have data, can you make any decisions? Can you prove your decisions if you do not have any data? So transparency in the data is very, very important. And in terms of Hong Kong exchange, they have listed out these four uh, parameters within which you have to report ESG. So the first parameter is quantitative. So I want you to understand what a KPI is. KPI is key performance indicator. So it will say like if you are a company in the uh, let's say um, oil industry then water pollution is one of the most important KPIs. If you are a manufacturing company then some other kind of KPI is more important to you. So your data has to be quantitative which means when you say that in 2018 my carbon emissions were let's say at 1 million level. So in 2019 you have to disclose that your carbon emissions have increased or decreased, or if they have increased, because of what? If they have decreased, because of what? So if the data is quantifiable, it is easier for the reader to make comparison that, oh, I can see why this happened. Second point is your data has to be material, which means that different kind of companies would have different kind of materiality aspects. For example, if I am a fintech company, I can simply boast, you know what, I have caused zero water pollution. Sorry, what do you mean by that? You are a fintech company. You don't use water as a resource. Whereas if I am, an, if I am a um, mining company and I say that, you know, my data security has been the best. Well, yes, you need that, but your key performance indicators are different. As a fintech company, you, your first KPI is data security. As a, a mining company, your first KPI is, is the sector in which you are operating, the kind of metals and minerals you are mining. The third point is consistency. If your data is not consistent, can you function? Can you read a report? I guess not. In 2018, you reported number of accidents as 27. In 2019, you have not reported if you had any accident. How do I see if you have made any improvement? I cannot see that. That's why your data has to be consistent. You should be able to see the progress. The fourth point is balance. You know what balance is? When you say that you have made good impact with, by doing this kind of system in your company, you have to report, I'm sorry, but I lost on this. So your data has to be balanced. You have to report good things, you have to report bad things, 
at the same time. Now let us move on to our main topic. Now you understand what ESG is? Now let us discuss if ESG, is it just a boardroom matter? Is it just one more agenda item on the table of board of directors? Yes, it's already a victory. We have made it to the board's agenda, which means board is forced to take decisions. The board is forced to measure the next steps, is forced to measure the performance and improvement and, and what kind of steps that they need to take in future, plan the targets, measure your risks. But what next? My point here is that the model of ESG percolates much deeper in the corporate thread. For example, as a board of director, I just say that, oh, I have a policy where we are going to bring in diversity, which means we are going to employ people of all colors, all kinds of genders. We are going to pe employ people which are, who are skilled, unskilled, and also who are young and old. But the reality is in my company, let's say it's an IT company, and I employ only men who are between the age of 20 to 35. So what does it mean? Having a policy at board level and not following it at the company level is a joke. So even if you have ESG as the board, board's agenda item, but if it does not reflect your company's behavior, it's a sham. So ESG, I have to say that it goes to the grassroots level. It has to go through all your departments and departments within departments. It must be an internal policy of the board to follow. And your further all internal policies as a company, like you must have a whistleblowing policy, you must have your code of conduct, you must follow your ethics policy. You should say throughout your company that we follow a policy of anti-money laundering. We follow a policy of no bribery. And if anyone is seen doing these kind of things which are against the company's policy, this is the list of steps that we are going to take against you. Let's say green is the new black. This is the trend now. Everyone wants to be green. Uh, if you are a woman, definitely you know about this brand called Sephora, which is against uh, animal cruelty. So uh, it attracts a lot of women that they have kind of mandated that we want to go stick with this brand because this uses no cruelty. And this is how companies are now promoting themselves as a brand that I'm the company, let's say Pepsi, which has taken a lot of constructive steps. Uh, if you see their annual reports, you will see that they have decreased their um, climate related issues uh, in terms of water by 20%, which is a achievement in itself. Similarly, Marks and Spencers has also set up similar kind of roles and they have achieved it. So companies definitely are going to boast about these kind of achievements in their annual reports. And it is, of course, an attraction. Profit is not the attraction. ESG is. There was a research by Morgan Stanley which found that 95% people were interested in sustainable investing. There was another research which found that there was three categories of people who were interested in ESG the most. First, millennials. I, I believe most of you are millennials. So you are the people who are going to inherit all the money you are going to be the most influential decision makers. You are going to have all the trillions of dollars in the years to come. So your belief, your principles matter. Your decision making matters. The second uh, group is the women. Women, even if they are working or they are not working, they are generally the decision makers. So they decide which kind of products they will use at home. They do the, most of the shopping, so they are very, um, I would say they are kind of very aware about what kind of products they are using. The third category is the institutional investors. 
I would say most of the money lies there. So if institutional investors also are on the same side of the story, you already weigh high in terms of decision making. If you are aware of UK's stewardship code, then it also recognizes that climate change is a risk to investments, beneficiaries' returns, which means that it's a kind of code given to the investors that when you are investing, like if you are an asset management firm, if you are an insurance company, and you want to increase further your investments, then this is the list of do's and don'ts that you should, that you should take care of. MSCI is another research company in the area of ESG, and they found that the highest ESG-rated companies outperformed the lowest ones by 40%. I think this research shows itself the impact of ESG on the market. ESG ETF, which is exchange-traded funds, they are on the rise. If you look at the Hong Kong's SFC, uh, Security Futures Commission's website, you will see that they have a list of uh, green funds. Uh, I encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to encourage people who value ESG in terms of investments. These are the few um, ESG rating agencies. I'm sure all of you know what Dow Jones is. Uh, MSCI is, an, is another research agency, Bloomberg and Hang Seng. I wanted to give you an overview as to how an ESG report looks like. So this is how it looks like. Companies are reporting their safety levels, climate change, biodiversity, uh, performance in terms of all these aspects. So uh, I again encourage you to go to all these annual reports and see for yourself and see what kind of differences they are, the difference they are making or bringing to the society. I have also collated a list of the good boys of ESG. So these are the top performers of ESG. You can see their rankings, and, and I think most of you know uh, these brands. So, so if you value ESG, you would think that, OK, I'm happy that the product that I'm using is backed by a company which believes in ESG. I have also uh, collated a list of five Ds. So if you are a company and you do not know where to start in terms of ESG, this is a good guide for you. The first is digitalization. Um, I have a joke for you. Um, there was a joke uh, which said that, who has um, influenced your digitalization in the company? Is it your CEO? Is it board of directors? Or coronavirus? So, of course, the answer is coronavirus. Because before this, people uh, in different departments, the heads of the departments, never thought that digitalization was such an emergency. But with the virus, we have learned to live with the new normal of working from home, of having all the data at home, having how to um, not go to work, how to have your small office at home. Next is decarbonization, which means less carbon emissions. More and more disclosures, adequate disclosures. Bringing in more and more diversity. You employ people of all genders, of all colors and ages. And last but not the least, data security. If you are working from home, but your data is not secure, do you know what you risk? In Hong Kong, we already have the data privacy laws. What if, you, if your data is leaked? You lose face, you lose your brand. I mean, in financial terms, it's a big loss. Plus, you are exposed to legal risks. So ESG is good. It's a great idea. Whatever we have discussed, very good. But is it enough? The problem is that companies, just to win over trusts, trust, are using inaccurate data. Companies are using it as only a box-taking exercise. Oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. But effectively, they are not um, producing enough data in front of you to, to kind of see and compare as to what kind of progress it has been. There has been a big disparity between actual data and the presentation of ESG data, which means you are 
indirectly cheating. There is a big gap between practicing and preaching, which means you talk about having ESG, your board has great policies, but when it comes to implementation, you do not do your groundwork, you, are not, you do not have your internal systems where the decisions that have been taken at the board level uh, can be implemented at the ground level. ESG has been used as a marketing ploy, which means you give fake data and you are trying to use that to attract investments from big investors, big financial institutions. The ESG rating providers, since there is no standard format as to how your report should look like, you have a big, um, I would say, a big gap in terms of consistency. So if I am, say, one agency and you are another, if we review the same company, your data and my data would be completely different. Maybe my data shows that this company is brilliant, you must invest. But when you review the same data for the same year, you conclude that, no, la, this company is not good. So this shows that the presentation of data is, is flawed unless it is standardized. Resistance to ESG is the biggest hurdle. To tell you the ground reality, if you see the statement from the Chamber of um, Listed Companies in Hong Kong, they said that the further disclosures from, uh, on ESG matters are cumbersome. So you see, this is how companies are trying to not have the burden of disclosing so much of ESG data. So what can the companies do? If you do not know what a black swan is, um, it's, a, it's a concept which means like a surprise, like a bad surprise, something which can come up anytime and asks you, are you prepared? So the biggest black swan that the whole world has seen lately is the virus. There have been winners and losers. The companies which had properly prepared, which have such kind of policies, internal policies, that they have been prepared for such situations have been the winners. And the companies which were not prepared for facing such kind of situations are the losers. The supply chains were severely disrupted. So the continents where the, most of the um, raw material was coming or the, finan the final goods were going out. So those kind of supply chains have been severely affected because there were issues in transportation, there were issues in communication, offices were not working. Not all the companies had provided proper internet uh, to their transport department or their supply chain management. A lot of governments have taken the initiatives of announcing subsidies for green plans. Uh, the most recent one I read was um, in South Korea. They have, the government has announced a few industries where um, if you use green uh, systems, they would give you subsidies in taxation and provide you some kind of incentive also. And I believe that all the governments should do that. Companies which are CSR compliant, corporate social responsibilities, uh, I can give you this example, like for example in India, uh, the stock exchange has set one amount that if your capital is above this limit, you have to contribute towards CSR some certain percentage of your profits. And I leave it up to you to decide if it is a great thing or not so good, or you think we are not so prepared for this. So if you believe in ESG, if you do not believe in ESG, that is secondary. The fact, the reality is, if you do not believe in ESG, if you do not have implemented ESG in your company, you are exposed to financial risks, legal risks, reputational risks, and market risks, like we discussed the case of Samsung. Here is the list of few companies. Samsung, like I have explained, Volkswagen is the classic, classic case for ESG. I encourage all of you to go and read about this case. Volkswagen is a car company. It's, it was in the top five uh, in, in the world. And they cheated on their emissions. They had some kind of software installed in the cars which did not let uh, the, the person checking the pollution check that the, that the car was, was producing pollution. 
in reality, whatever measurement that you got, the actual data was 40 times more pollution. And the result, there were multiple lawsuits on Volkswagen. Ultimately, they had to repurchase the cars they had sold. In US alone, the number was more than half a million cars. Imagine as a company, you, you, you had such a short vision on profitability alone, and you ended up paying such kind of uh, legal costs for it. The case of Starbucks, I'm sure all of you know, uh, this case where of race, racial discrimination, there were customer strikes and boycotts, and there was a four-hour suspension. But the good thing is that Starbucks took action immediately. They started with this, and they trained their staff as to how to deal with such kind of discrimination in the in, in future. Wirecard, if you do not know this, I encourage you to read Financial Times where Wirecard case has been discussed in very detail. Uh, this is a German listed company and the fraud amounts to more than 3.5 billion euros. I encourage you to read this case. Facebook, I'm sure all of you know the data breach and there were a lot of millions of dollars in fines imposed on them. So now let's discuss. We, we know the good things, we know the bad things, we know the problems. So what should we do? If you are a company, I suggest that you standardize your reports, which means you prepare a dashboard in which you can see, okay, I have moved from this level to this level. You self-regulate. You hire ESG qualified staff who can pinpoint that maybe you need to make this change. How about we have this policy? How about we train our staff? Avoid greenwashing. Greenwashing basically means providing more green components on your report, but actually not having any. Enhance comparability. This is the most important step that all the companies should do. When you're talking of financial data, you can see financial data. This is the trajectory. I can see the profits increasing. I can see the sales increasing. But to enhance the comparability, you should do exactly the same for ESG data also. If you are a regulator, you need to adopt a size-based phased approach. So in the first phase, we do this. In the second phase, we do this. You have to provide clearer guidelines on reporting. If you see Hong Kong Exchange's website on ESG, and I encourage again as students, you, you definitely go and read more about ESG. There are not exact clear guidelines as to how you should report. So that is why the, company, the regulators have to step in and see how they can provide clearer um, instructions for the companies to follow and to avoid any kind of breach of rules. Since no two companies are same, there is no one size fits all, which means there cannot be just one guideline applicable on everyone. So regulators have to be very careful about this point. As an investor, I have to say that you have to encourage the meaningful disclosure. You simply do not say that, oh, I do not see this on your report, I reject you. No, you have to encourage meaningful disclosure. You have to be more realistic in what you demand. You have to favor the green products so that the companies which are not following the green systems, they feel the compulsion to go ahead and invest. Another point I want to share is, um, I was reading a report by uh, some asset management firm in Europe, and they said that uh, when they were investing, they found one company, and they told them that if you follow ESG, we are going to give you a loan discount of 15 bips which means if your, loan, if your loan percentage was, let's say, 8%, now, if you follow ESG, we're going to give you a discount of 0 0.15. So this is one of the direct impacts of ESG that you can see. If you are an ESG rating provider, I suggest that it's a high time that all of us, all the rating providers, form general consensus and form best practices. You bring more transparency in your data your data should not be sale worthy. If I'm a company and I pay you, you do not greenwash your reports. And all the rating providers should even out their method methodologies so that 
all the methodologies for a particular kind of company should be visible and it is easy to compare for future purposes. To conclude, is ESG just a boardroom matter? No. We just discussed the corporate thread has to embrace the green color from departments to lower departments to departments within departments. The whole company has to reflect ESG as a culture. Should everyone jump the ESG bandwagon and ignore profitability? Mm, yes and no. ESG is not for everyone. If you are a startup company, if you do not concentrate on profitability, there is no way you would be able to sustain in this kind of competition, competitive environment. So it is important for you to make your mark first and then in a phased approach, you start following ESG. Are we ready for mandatory ESG compliance? Not really. I think ESG is still at a developing phase where the, the regulators, the companies, the investors, all of them are doing a lot of trial and error methods and developing to see uh, what suits their needs best. Like I said, the ESG system, the framework has been, is less than 20 years old and we need some more time for it to become mandatory. To conclude, I think ESG is a journey, it's not a destination and we have a long way to go. So I want to thank you first of all for all your attention and your time and I hope that you learned uh, about ESG and I'm leaving you with food for thought. Thank you.